African uh, continent. Uh, uh, coming to you, Mr. Arthur Mobley, we have analyzed and, of course, looking at uh, the uh, advantages uh, that uh, present uh, if, uh, with Africa if they join uh, these strong economic uh, uh, blocks that have actually uh, uh, recorded uh, remarkable transformation. So now the question is, uh, when we come back to the African continent, we still have this issue of uh, the fact that uh, the African continent is actually divided in many uh, uh, dimensions, like we're talking about uh, the uh, uh, the, the, the fact that we don't have a, a, a single, even though with the, the African continent uh, free trade area, you still see that there is uh, this uh, disintegration across the African continent. The differences in the currency, uh, uh, of course, the fact that it is difficult uh, on political lines for countries to actually uh, maybe surrender their autonomy and every other obstacle that presents the African continent. Now, at the global stage, what do you think are the right, uh, uh, maybe is the right uh, uh, modus operandi that uh, the stakeholders, especially political stakeholders in Africa can actually develop to be able to maximize the opportunities of the uh, uh, presented by these uh, economic blocks or, or global economic blocks, uh, according to some pundit, the fact that Africans always go to the table or negotiating table as uh, different en uh, entities or states rather than just one global uh, 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 body, it's already a setback and it actually uh, reduces the uh, advantages that, that Africa can get from uh, these uh, uh, a world of uh, uh, of global integration. So, in your opinion, what what do you think is pragmatic in this uh, era? Well, again, thank you, uh, Clarice, for the forum and the question. Um, Africa is still in a place of stagnation because, as uh, as our other panelists have, have pointed out, we have fractionalization on the continent. Until Africa can project a stronger sense of unity, and I think the African Union, which developed out of the Organization for African uh, Unity, the OAU, uh, that was the strategy. That was, that was the plan back then. But that plan was constantly interrupted. It was constantly destabilized. It was constantly attacked by those colonial forces that wanted to keep Africa in a state of uh, chaos because it is ununified, it is disunified, it is fractionalized. So the fractionalization of Africa what we're experiencing in Africa today serves a particular group of people internationally. We can't sugarcoat this. We can't pretend like it doesn't happen. We can't pretend like Africans are too naive to understand what, has, what, is, what is occurring. I think we as African people internationally, we have been long standing proponents of human equity. We have been uh, the uh, vocal force in the world for human rights. The human rights declarations go all the way back to the 1930s and 40s. So, you know, it, it, this is not new that we as even young people uh, can take up a philosophy and an idea that yes, we expect that all the world's people are one. We are all one human family. We understand that we get that because the human family and the human race originated originally from Africa, and anyone with any scientific understanding would, would, would note that. That is not the problem. The problem is those people who continue to benefit from a fractionalization of some people call them the uh, nations of the South. Uh, some people can just say those uh, uh, 
uh, unfortunate countries in places like Africa that uh, are, are, are not able to organize to a, to, to a degree where they can, they can catch on and they can, they can mobilize as a result of that organization. India knows full well what it takes to change a colonial system. China knows full well what it takes and what it took to change a colonial system. You have to throw off colonialism. You have to reject colonialism. And Africa's turn has finally come about. We've been struggling and working on it for the last 70 years or so. And bit by bit, state by state, we've been able to create at least an undercurrent movement of uh, resistance, resistance and objection to colonialism. So we're not going to allow colonialism to creep back in in any way. It's not going to come through the IMF, which IMF and World Bank were designed to promote colonialism. They were designed to perpetuate colonial systems and to create economic enslavement of people who were formally, militarily, and just culturally and socially enslaved. So we, again, we, we, some of us are a little older and you know we remember these things on our own flesh and our own spirit and our own proximity. I remember in the US places that I couldn't go uh, be admitted to. And I remember things that I couldn't do as a child. So if I can remember that, then surely, uh, certainly institutionally, we can, we can flash back a few years. So I, I say to young people in particular, notice what gets change. Notice what creates change in your culture. What created change recently in Africa was what happened in the Sahel. What happened in what happened in China, for that matter? We have to observe and be students of history, not just trying to uh, be uh, in the moment and in the present. We have to understand that history does have an impact on where we are today. Absolutely. So, if we're students in understanding what just happened just a few decades ago. We will we will know where we've been and uh, what we what we must do. But I agitate and I ask uh, Africans to continue to be vigilant and to continue to push for the kinds of change that you want. You see that if you push the military in your countries, you can force them to change outdated uh, backwards governments and open the way for real independence and true democracy as they have in India and as they have in China and as they have in other parts of the world, Europe and uh, are, are, are garnering even in, in Latin America these days. Africa is only behind because of the oppression that continues to be exerted against Africa. The destabilization, the underdevelopment of Africa is exactly what is keeping Africa in the state that it's in. But there is resistance on the ground in Africa. We know that. We can't ignore it. The G20 isn't ignoring it. That's why they come to ta table with this Johnny come lately idea of, of uh, admitting Africa into the G20. And there'll be others. There'll be other bids to placate and to patronize Africa. But those are the things that need to be outright resisted because the time is too urgent. Global warming is real. We do not have another 20, 30, 40 years to uh, progressively go through these incremental steps. Africa has the intelligence. It has the educated community today to do whatever you want to do in Africa. You can do it today. The populations exist. You don't have to wait for children to be educated or uh, another generation or two to be educated before you move forward in Africa to implement the same things that you have in Europe or America or Russia or anywhere else in the world. Africa is equivalent now. So we need to dismiss the nonsense and dismiss 
these myths about Africa and realize that Africa is ready right now today to participate on the international stage at any table, whether it's the Security Council. How does Security Council have five seats and no Africans on the Security Council? Sure. How does that happen? How, does, how, how are these international bodies being controlled by everyone else without any even inclusion or participation from Africa? Africa should be in a leadership role. So I applaud Cyril Ramaphosa and where South Africa is in the BRICS. As far as I'm concerned, Cyril Ramaphosa speaks for all of Africa. We have to acquiesce and understand that we can't have 57 uh, representatives of 57 countries sitting in these particular places. Sometimes we have to realize that, that Africans can speak for us, whether they're in South Africa or they're in Cameroon or they're in Mali or the, whether they're in Ethiopia. I, 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 I acquiesce all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm African first and whatever our distinction would be put on me in a secondary sense. So I, I, I think that's where we are. That's what time it is. And, and uh, the world and our friends around the world need to support us in that fact, in that reality. Africa needs to be accelerated forward, not incrementally moved in baby steps because someone thinks that that's more manageable from, from, from their standpoint. But it's not going to continue to work. The African people 